Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I am glad you're here on this bright, sunny, but a bit chilly morning. Um, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, during this quiet time, we ask for your peace. Holy Spirit, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears in preparation for this time together. Lord, forgive us of our oversights, those times when we should have chosen kindness, but we chose hostility, when we should have chosen to hold our tongues, but we reacted, we reacted with a caustic response. Lord, forgive us and free us for joyful obedience to do your will, to act as the light of the world, to act as Jesus would. Father God, we thank you for your grace, your unmerited love given to us, not because we deserve it, because we don't. Not because we've earned it, because we can't, but because you love us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand as you're able and let's sing our professional hymn, pr processional hymn, <laughs> Guide Me, O Great Jehovah, page 127. standing as we unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, self under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
please be seated. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor. I want to add my word of greeting to that which Lisa has already shared with you this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us in worship. We're also grateful for those of you who may be visiting with us, and we hope that your time with us is a, an opportunity for you to connect with God, but we also want you to connect with some of the folks that are here, and so if there's any way that we can uh, facilitate that, uh, Terry Stubblefield, our associate pastor, or I will be happy uh, to meet with you and to help you find your way into this congregation. We believe that we exist to offer creative experiences that lead people to inspiring encounters with God, meaningful engagement with each other, and lifelong transformation. And every day of every week, we're looking for ways that we can grow in our relationship with God, and we would love for you to come and to be a part of that. The connection card is part of the worship bulletin, and if everyone would fill that out, and just an added word to the visitors, uh, you can feel safe in giving us your information. We're not going to show up at your doorstep. Uh, we would like to send you a note thanking you for your visit. Um, but this is a way for us to uh, communicate in our congregation. Uh, if there's any information that anybody would like to receive, you can make that request on the connection card. Uh, there's also a place where you can register for dinner for Wednesday evening. And um, when the offering plate is passed, then put the connection card in there. A couple of updates about some pastoral needs in our congregation. Uh, Louise Petit passed away, and her funeral will be here on Friday. Uh, we're still working on the time, uh, but uh, Terry will be presiding over that funeral and we'll have the details out as soon as possible. I was given the gift of a sixth grandchild this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have a whole lot to do with it, but I appreciate the applause anyway. Uh, on Thursday, uh, my son Adam and his wife Kelly uh, welcomed into the world William John Cohen uh, at eight pounds, six and a half ounces, and uh, I got by to see him on Friday. It was a pastoral visit. He just had a circumcision, and so I prayed for him. I didn't do the circumcision, if you were wondering. I am a Cohen. I am a Cohen, but not that kind of Cohen. So. Uh, I mentioned Wednesday evenings. We'd love for you to join us. Um, our Theological Dialogue on Human Sexuality will take place on Sunday, February 23rd uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. That's just a couple of weeks away. Ash Wednesday is just around the corner, Wednesday the 26th, and we'll have an Ash Wednesday service here at 6 p.m. Uh, go ahead and get that on your calendar. We'd love for you to be here for that. And our 4th, 5th, and 6th graders have a retreat coming up in March, and there's information about that in the bulletin. Uh, if you know of any 4th, 5th, or 6th graders, we'd love for them uh, to be a part of this retreat. This is getting old, but Linda's still with us. Alex is still in London. Uh, we did hear from Homeland Security uh, this week, and they just need a little more information. And um, so we'll get that information to them. Uh, the information they're requesting didn't signal any red flags or anything. Um, I'm glad to know that Alex is not a terrorist, um, but uh, we're, we're excited that we're making progress, but I'm just ready for it to happen. Um, but thank God for Linda May, so thank you, Linda. <laughs> this week, our finance committee is going to meet, our administrative board is going to meet, and uh, we'll be finalizing our budget for 2020. And uh, over the last several weeks, we've been pouring over the numbers and looking at the income side and looking at the expense side. And, and um, the beautiful thing is that um, we have everything we need to do the ministry that God is calling us to do. Um, not that we couldn't expand some of the things that we're doing, but your generosity is providing the resources that are needed for us to do what God is calling us to do. And we're so grateful to you and for your faithfulness. And it's, it's, a, it's a key 
thing that I'm saying here is through your faithfulness because you're listening to God, you're allowing God to lead you as God leads us and where God gives a vision, God gives provision, but God gives provision through his people and you have responded. And so I'm very, very grateful for that. And as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings for this day, then allow me to offer this blessing. Let us pray. God of mercy, redemption, and grace, this morning we bring our gifts and pray that you will dedicate them to your work of love and reconnection with all your children. In our giving, may we grow in gratitude, trust, and faithfulness. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave his all for us. Amen.
be seated. Pray along with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we ask your blessings of peace, comfort, and healing on our brothers and sisters, our loved ones who are suffering in any way. We ask your blessings on this church, Florence First United Methodist Church, and on the worldwide United Methodist Church. And we pray the daily prayer of John Wesley. Consider this prayer. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praise for you or criticize for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. And let us be able to pray the prayer of Jesus together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. stand while I read the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 5, 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot hide. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that you may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Nice Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Our gospel reading for today comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Thousands of people had gathered on the hillside along the shore of the Sea of Galilee because they were curious about what this teacher had to say. Word had been spreading throughout the countryside. And so Jesus begins telling them something like this. You're called to be my apprentices, to be my followers, my disciples. I will teach you and show you how to live in the new way of life that God is bringing into the world through me. And then he says this, where we pick up with our reading for today. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now the Greek word translated here as you is humice, and it's an emphatic you, like you yourselves, or yes, you. John Jameson says, like the crowd in Galilee, uh, like us, that the crowd in Galilee had salt in their homes. It wasn't in a shaker like what we have. Rather, they would have what was a salt rock purchased from a vendor or collected from the shores of the Great Sea about 30 miles to the west. It was a rock that was coated in layers of salt. And this was the deposit that was left after the water evaporated. And so at a meal when someone wanted salt, they would just grab that grapefruit-sized rock off the table and they'd scrape off the salt that they wanted. And of course, at some point, you've scraped off all the salt and there's no salt left and all you have is a rock which is useless if you want to salt something so Jesus is telling us that he wants us and his followers to enhance the lives of others lest we lose our influence in the world to keep our saltiness but then before we've even had a chance to fully process that imagery he throws a net, another metaphor into the mix he says you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Again, there's that emphatic you in verse 14 that we saw in verse 13. You, yes, you are the light of the world. James Howell notes that the lamp that Jesus is referring to here would have been a ubiquitous object to Jesus' listeners because every household had a lamp. It was the small terracotta kind of lamp. If you've ever been to the Holy Land, then surely you've seen it. It doesn't put off very much light at all, and it's laughable to think that anybody would put it up under a bushel, but rather you would have to put it up on a lampstand in order for it to be of any benefit at all. And then when Jesus referenced the city built on a hill, he probably pointed to the north. Along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, on up there was a mountain about 3,000 feet above sea level, and it's the city of Sephat, the highest city in all of Israel. And during the second temple period that included the time in which Jesus walked the earth in his ministry, it was one of five cities where they would, uh, they were elevated cities where they would build fires on the first day of the month on the Hebrew calendar every month to uh, signified the new moon, a new beginning. And so those who had gathered to hear Jesus on the shore of Galilee 
would have often seen the fires up there at Safat burning uh, as a sign of the new moon. Even to this day, Safat is a center for Jewish learning and mysticism. But Jesus here is inviting his followers and us to be the bright hope of the world as we illuminate the world with his love. The next part of the passage begins to get difficult. It's probably the most difficult passage to be found in Matthew's gospel. And it begins with verse 17 where Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. The difficulty in interpreting this passage is found in two words that are somewhat, um, uh, somewhat uh, unclear, and those are the words that we have translated here as abolish and the word translated as fulfill. The New Testament scholar Douglas R. A. Hare paraphrases verse 17 this way, thinking that this is what gets closest to the original Greek. He says, do not suppose that my mission is to abrogate the law or the prophet's interpretation of the law. My mission is not to abrogate, but rather to confirm the law and the prophets by interpreting scripture in terms of God's ultimate will. One of the things that makes this particular passage so difficult to interpret is because Jesus seems to be saying one thing here, but elsewhere in the scriptures, it's like he's saying something different. And we can begin to feel the tension of that. For instance, Jesus at times set the law and the prophets against each other. Jesus was fond of quoting the prophets saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice which, of course, was a prophetic critique of the sacrificial law that was a, a big part of Jewish law. The law clearly indicated that God not only wanted sacrifices, but that the sacrifices had to be carried out with a specific process that was guided by a meticulous set of rules. Jesus, in quoting the prophets, indicated Otherwise, though, saying that God despises sacrifices and wants God's people to be merciful instead. There's that tension. There's that row. To add a little more context and complexity, we should note that Jesus' reference to uh, the law here directly precedes what is known in the Sermon on the Mount as the antitheses. And the antitheses are the scriptures where Jesus begins by saying, you have heard it said, and then concludes, but I say to you. In the antitheses, Jesus challenges the law head on. With this context in mind, it's problematic to assume that Jesus, in Verse 17 is simply maintaining the traditional understanding of the law as the standard that determines our salvation. Even before looking at the specific content of the teachings in Matthew 5, verses 21 through 48, it's clear that, according to Nathan Nettleton, Jesus is claiming the authority to interpret or reinterpret these laws. And because he is also asserting that nothing is being discarded, nothing is being left out, he is claiming the authority, the authority to be able to reveal to us the true meaning of the law or what it always meant in terms of who God is and what God really wants. Nettleton goes on to say, Of course, if you've read the Sermon on the Mount, you will probably realize that the reinterpretations given by Jesus don't make it any more likely we will easily be able to fulfill the letter of the law. Jesus says it's not, just an, it's not enough to just not murder, but Jesus says you shouldn't even get angry with anyone. 
Jesus says it's not enough to just not commit adultery. Jesus says you should not even look at another person with lust in your eyes. Jesus' reinterpretation intensifies the standard of the law in new ways. He continues in verses 18 and 19. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And here he's talking about until all of the law is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that the law of Moses will stay around until heaven and earth themselves disappear. And until that happens, not one punctuation mark in those laws is going to be changed. He said any person who breaks one of these laws, even the smallest of them, will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Were you listening? Did you catch it? Did you hear it? Did you miss it? Jesus says that even the person who breaks the law still makes it into the kingdom of heaven. They'll have a lesser place, but they're still in the kingdom. There must be a different standard for our salvation. And verse 20 lays that standard out for us to see. Verse 20 says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I can imagine that in the crowd that day, there were two different responses. A lot of the Pharisees were really good men. They were honorable and filled with integrity, and they kept the law, and a lot of people looked up to the scribes and the Pharisees. And so when Jesus said that your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees, some people there probably said, I don't have a chance. They study the law every day. They, they know it backwards and forwards. I could never have that grasp of the law. But I think there were probably others there who had a different response, and maybe a lot of others there who had a different response, that Jesus' words would have resonated in a particular way. For even though the scribes and the Pharisees were the experts on the law of Moses, and even though they memorized the law word for word, and even though they spent every day of their lives interpreting and enforcing the law of Moses, they did not live in the spirit of the law. They knew the words, but the reason behind them was lost. The meaning wasn't there. Outwardly, they were holy, law-abiding and God-fearing leaders of the Jewish nation. But too often, for many, beneath their robes, they were corrupt, self-serving thieves using God as an excuse for doing anything they wanted to do. Everyone knew it, but no one ever said it out loud for fear of retribution until Jesus showed up. I want to return to the image, the second of the first two images that I talked about this morning, the image of a city on a hill that can't be hid. This is in verse 14. Because in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 6 and 7, we see the people of Israel referred to as the light of the nations. It says, I am the Lord I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, 
from the prison those who sit in darkness. In this passage, Isaiah is describing something. No, he's describing someone who helps us find our way. The law of Moses was intended to open people's eyes and to lead people out of bondage and into freedom. The scribes and the Pharisees had corrupted the law, expecting people to blindly follow their lead. And they turned the law back into another kind of bondage. They failed to apply the law in a way that would produce righteousness, and instead it became a barrier to righteousness. What the image of the light on the hill tells us is that there is a clear direction emerging. If we keep following God's light, that is Jesus, the way will become clearer and clearer. Remember, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we follow, Jesus will give us the direction that we need. When we take the whole sweep of the Bible, the overall direction becomes clearer and clearer. And what Jesus seems to be saying, and what I'm saying to you today, is that Jesus himself, his life, his ministry, his teaching, his death, and his resurrection are the definitive revelation of who God is, what God is like, and what God asks of each of us. If we follow the light of Jesus, it will take us all the way from a primitive view of a fearsome God whose uncontainable power would kill us if not placated by the sacrifice of blood, all the way to a God whose love knows no bounds and who would rather sacrifice himself to our violence than give up on loving us. This is the same God who forgives us and welcomes us with open arms and whose desire it is that we model all of our relationships on the relationship that he has with us, a relationship of love and mercy. The heart of the matter is what we believe about the nature of God. And how we understand God and understand God's relationship with the world and God's relationship with humankind, including each of us. If God is viewed only as a lawgiver, as a law enforcer, and as a judge, then our lives will be focused not on Jesus, but will be focused on learning the laws, enforcing the laws, looking for people who are violating the laws, and judging those who break the laws. This can lead to an air of superiority where we think we know how other people should be punished for their sins while having been blinded by self-righteousness like the scribes and the Pharisees, completely ignoring the consequences of our own sins and the toll that our sins take not only on us but on others and on the world. So when Jesus says things like, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I say to you, do not even get angry or insult anyone. He's not saying because if you do, there's an angry, bloodthirsty God keeping score of your failings who will cast you into hell if you don't comply with this new law. That's not what he's saying. Rather, he's saying something more like this. If you tried with all your might to become all that God desires for you to become, and you did it by turning that desire into laws, laws that you had to follow, this is how absurdly impossible it would be to keep those laws. You could never live up to them. So what's the alternative? Set your sights on Jesus. 
the light on the hill. The light of the world. And follow wherever he leads. And he will not lead you astray. And where you go when you follow Jesus will fulfill the law. God will be pleased with you. For those among us who feel insecure with only lights to follow and no laws, Matthew reminds us of this exchange that Jesus had with the Pharisee. The Pharisee came to Jesus and said, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. <coughs> Excuse me. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then see this. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. The law is designed to help us to love God fully and to love each other fully. Earlier in Matthew 5, Jesus blurred the distinction between the light and the law when he said this, You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. It's like Jesus is saying, just model your lives on me. Follow my light and everything will fall into place not one jot or tittle or iota or mark of the law will go unfulfilled if you just follow me. Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection redefined righteousness. Keeping laws does not make us righteous. We can only be made righteous by God's love and forgiveness that was activated through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a gift that we receive by faith. We become a reconciled child of God. And remember, even if we break, even if we break the law, we're still in the kingdom. We're still apart because nobody gets in the kingdom on their own. Everybody gets in by the grace of God. It's our reliance upon the Holy Spirit that then leads us into the ethical life, the moral life, not out of blind obedience, not out of chasing the law, but rather chasing the love that God so freely gives us. It's a heartfelt desire to please the one who loves us so deeply. That is the righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. That is the life to which we are called. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Oh God, sometimes it seems like we do everything we can to frustrate your grace. Grace is grace. Open our hearts to receive your love. And once we have received your love, then we trust you in transforming us in whatever way we need to be transformed. But it always begins with your love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 514. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing all four stanzas of Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
I love the first two lines of the third stanza that say, Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. The Apostle Paul struggled with the tension between the law and grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, some translations translate it this way, where in essence he says that the law, the letter of the law kills. It is the spirit that brings life. In Galatians 5, when it talks about the fruit of the spirit, when we, when we follow that light and we live in the spirit, then our lives begin to take on the moral characteristics of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But that verse in 525 goes on to say, against such there is no law. Why do we need a law against love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? That's not what Paul was saying. He's saying we need no law when we love, when we're joyful. Because it's the law of love that drives us. It's that spirit-filled life that there's no law necessary because we respond out of love, out of joy, out of peace, out of patience, and so on. And so, trust in the grace of God but also trust that when that grace of God gets loose in you, that it will change you. It will transform you. Not because you have to conform to the law, but because love changes everything. Go in peace and serve the Lord with gladness in all you do. Amen and amen.